Our gospel lesson for this Sunday after the Pentecost is found in the Mark, book of Mark, chapter 10. Glory be to you, O Lord. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we might ask of you. Jesus said to them, What do you mean? What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in the, your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I baptize? They said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall baptize, be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. It is for those who, to whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the other ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles domineer over them. Their people in high position exercise authority over them. It is not to be this way amongst you. Rather, who wants to become prominent amongst you shall be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. For many. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks again for the blessings of this lesson today and ask you to open up our hearts to your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'm very grateful to be able to join you today, maybe not the way I normally do, but thank you for your patience and tolerance. And we're so grateful that you're here today and hope that this lesson is a blessing to you. This is kind of a combination of a series of lessons that we've been hearing over the last weeks. Over and over and over and over again, Jesus has to confront his disciples and tell them their view of what it meant for him to be the Messiah was not what they had been taught. Was in conflict with everything they thought that they knew. And so he continued to try to get them straight. He, see, this is one of the things I really love about the Bible. Because it presents the heroes of faith, James and John and Peter and all of the disciples, as really dimwits. You know, who would write a book like this? If we want to present our heroes of, heroes of our country, heroes of our faith, heroes of our organization, we just diminish uh, any of the faults and warts, we just take them away. It's kind of like the painting, famous painting of Oliver, Oliver Cromwell, and maybe you remember that name from English history. Oliver Cromwell came to take a look at a painting that was done of him. It was to be the, his official portrait, and he took one look at it, and apparently Oliver Cromwell was a very, uh, was not a very good looking man, by the way. Uh, he came and took a look at it, and all of the wrinkles, all of the warts, all of the faults in his face and in his body were just taken away. So he looked like this very distinguished, handsome man. And he came and he took a look and he said, What is this? And he said, It's your painting. And he said, This is not a painting of me. He said, There's no warts. There's no faults. There's no wrinkles. And the artist was just dumbfounded because apparently this is a pretty famous artist who had done this. He said, Put all those warts and faults in because that's who I am. I love this about the Bible. We see all the warts and all the faults of the disciples. And so I'm going to tell you, over and over and over again, if you've been following along with the lessons, you've heard how Jesus had to confront these dim-witted disciples of his, you and me, over and over again because we are so reticent to change our view of what we think should be. And so I'm going to go through this context Again, nine times Jesus confronted his disciples about the allure of power and the true purpose of the coming kingdom, and they just didn't get it. First time, Mark 8, the Messiah will die, Jesus says, not establish an earthly kingdom. Oh, no, Jesus, that's not going to happen to you, Mark 9. There is no hierarchy in the kingdom of heaven, Mark 9, 30 to 32. The Messiah will die, this is the second time he's told them this. They still don't get this. Uh, Mark 9, 33. The greatest in the kingdom are to be servants of all. Huh? They've, so they've heard this lesson before. They still didn't respond to it. Mark 9, 38. Warning! It is better to mutilate your body than to be like the elitist 
Those in the air, scribes and the Pharisees, okay? Mark 10, which, by the way, mutilating your body in any way was considered to be a grievous sin. But it's better to do that than to be like the scribes and the Pharisees. Mark 10, children are the prototype of those who are to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mark 10, 17, wealth is not going to buy a person a seat in the kingdom of heaven. That was shocking revelation. Mark 10, 32 to 34, the Messiah is going to die. And that today, guess what? The greatest in God's kingdom are to be those who've come to serve. You'd think by now they'd get it, but they don't. They still will wrestle with it for quite a while. So this sets up the story of this. It's not like James and John haven't been giving a fair warning. But yet they come and they approach Jesus anyway, wanting to know, to clarify, is it going to be us who are going to sit in your right hand and left hand? This is the culmination of these discussions. They've been playing around with this for, for quite a while here with Jesus. They've been looking at Peter and saying, oh, Peter's going to get one of those spots. They just know it. No, let's, make it, let's, make, let's push our way. Let's be aggressive. Let's make it us. So James and John, their ambition was likely result or stoked by their inclusion in Jesus' inner circle of three. Now remember what I told you, there's not necessarily anything wrong with ambition. We need to have ambition. I have a, you know, current ambitions in my life of things I'd like to accomplish and my studies and the things I'm doing. I hope you have ambitions too. But ambitions that take a toll on other people, that cost somebody else, something, that ambition is wrong, okay? This is their ambition. They wanted to be the top dogs, and they wanted the other ten to be ignored. How did they know that Jesus was even going to choose the right hand and left hand men out of those top twelve? How do we know that Jesus was going to pick a woman? I don't know. Mary Magdalene comes to mind. Just saying. Jesus confronts them and tells them the standard of greatness in the kingdom of heaven by the following two images. Can you drink from the cup which I drink? Now, I will tell you, I've read a lot, especially Lutheran and Episcopalian and Roman Catholic scholars who will say, Jesus is making a reference to Holy Communion. No, he's not. Do you know the cup can be used in, as something different than a reference to Holy Communion? I mean, you'd think by a Lutheran standard, by a Roman Catholic standard, or by an Episcopalian standard, if it says the cup, it must be communion. This isn't about communion today. It isn't. So I don't know. In fact, if you probably look at your devotional booklets, I haven't done this, but your devotional booklets uh, that we produce out of our Lutheran church, they may very well be written by a pastor who says, this is a reference to Holy Communion. It's not. Okay? So what is it a reference to? As I said, this cup isn't a reference to Holy Communion. What it is, it's about a king. Because this is the imagery that we're talking about. A king would take a cup and hand it to one of his guests. It was then a gift of the king to that person. It was a statement of the admiration of that king for that person. And a statement also that you are going to drink from the same cup the future that I drink of. It's, it was given to a person who was committed to the cause. So the good that comes, the bad that comes, I'm going to drink from your cup, my Lord, because I love you and I'm a follower of you. I'm committed to you. So it was a cup was a recognition that this person has earned that special favor. So again, the cup is a metaphor for sharing the plight of the king. So often you would share the happy circumstances of the cup, but uh, of the king. But that also meant if the king were executed and their heads cut off, the same thing would happen to you. So the cup was also a reference to judgment. If bad things happened, you are going to be standing there sharing the judgment too. <laughs> so that's what Jesus is saying. Now, from the disciples' perspective, of course they're going to say, "Sure, we can do that," because they didn't think there were going to be any trouble. Sometimes this is the Messiah, after all. Nothing bad's going to happen to him. Oh, didn't they hear? How many times did Jesus in previous lessons tell them that he was going to die? Remember, if you drink from the cup of the king, you are going to, again, partake of the bad as well as the good. That means you better be willing to die for the king. Not one of them was willing to do that on the night in which Jesus 
was betrayed. They weren't ready. So can you drink from this cup? Oh yes, we can. I can't dig bats. Can you be baptized? Will you be baptized with a baptism? Now once again, Lutheran scholars and Roman Catholic scholars and Episcopalian scholars, he's referring to the sacrament of holy baptism. No, he's not. He is not referring to the sacrament of holy baptism. This is not a reference to that sacrament. If you look at the right word in Greek, the Greek word means to be submerged in any experience, love, grief, doubt. What Jesus is basically saying is, are you willing to suffer with me? The success of the kingdom would be paid for on the cross. And the disciples would one day follow suit. If you remember your lesson and what I've taught to you about this, James and John, remember James, we are told, was executed. In fact, very early, we see that in, uh, in the book of Acts. So he was executed. But we also see John. John lived a very long life, but it was a very difficult life. All the other friends of his had been executed at some point, and he started wondering why he was left behind. It was a difficult life for him. See, there's consequences to seeking this power, and that is resentment. And so we're told in the lesson today that they started to resent James and John, the other ten disciples. So Jesus had to take them aside and get them straight once again. They resented the power play of James and John. How dare they? Because after all, it could have worked, right? So they began to bicker and argue amongst themselves. They all wanted to know how much control and how many people, uh, they wanted to know how much they would control and how many people they would impose, be able to impose their will upon. And, you know, this is actually the original sin in Genesis 3, isn't it? The desire to be in control, Genesis chapter 3, and place our will upon other people. It's laughable. After all, if you think about it, I mean, how big was their army anyway? Twelve? And they were going to pose their wills upon everybody in the world? Think about what did I tell you? Jesus, again, set them astraight. The standard of greatness is what again? Service. It's not reducing others to service. I really want you to read this poem, this poem by... Rudyard uh, Kipling. I'm just going to take a moment. I just found this really profound when you think about it in relationship to our interest in being powerful, being uh, having power, being in charge. Kipling said, If you stop to find out what your wages will be and how they will clothe and feed you, Willie, my son, don't you go to the sea. For the sea will never need you. If you ask for the reason of every command and argue about people about you, Willie, my son, don't you go to the land, for the land will do better without you. If you stop to consider the work that you've done and to boast about what your labor is worth, dear, angels may come for you, Willie, my son, but you'll never be wanted on earth, dear. With his power, Jesus, you see, could have organized his life in a manner to suit himself, to be served by other people, but rather, what did Jesus do? He chose to give his life as a ransom for many, the Bible says. Wait a minute, a ransom to whom? This is where we get into this very sticky theological point. People say, well, to God, to the devil, and there's a bunch of arguments about it. This is not meant to be a part of our systematic theology. It's just an image that Jesus is using. So get rid of this idea that Jesus somehow by his death is paying a ransom and ransoming the people of the earth from the devil or from God or whatever the case might be. It's not a concept meant to be into, uh, included into our, 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 our systematic theologies. It's an expression of the depth of Christ's love for us that he's willing to give himself on our behalf. In order to win us over, Jesus was willing to pay the cost of his life. So this is where this lesson ends for today, and this is what you are left with. And the question you need to ask yourself, it's kind of a sermon that doesn't have an end. I don't have any nice, warm, cushy things. We have to really struggle with this. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to daily struggle with this lesson. Because it's not a once-and-done thing. It's not like you've made a decision, oh, I'm going to be a servant of Christ. 
Great for you. Tomorrow you're going to struggle with the exact same issues. Maybe in a different form, because every single day this is going to be tested. Every single day you are going to be tested about what type of service you're going to give God. How are you going to live your life? How will people know you? How are you going to be known by other people? What do you think they say about you? Are you going to be known as the person who's always going around, I'm defending my rights, my right to own a gun, my right to enforce myself upon you, my right to not get a shot, my right to stick in your face my opinions. Is that how you're going to be known? Is that how you want your life to be known? Is that what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Every single day, we have to make a decision. How am I going to be known? Somebody who stands up for my rights. Or am I going to be known as somebody who gives myself for others' needs? Like I said, this is not a once and done decision that you've got to make. They're never definitively answered in your life because you're going to face what looks like a different circumstance and you're going to reflexively do something that hurts other people. It happens every day. And then other days you're going to do just a fantastic job and you're going to be a real blessing to somebody. This is the challenge of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Every single day we have to face these decisions. And so I'm going to pray for you today that God gives you the Holy Spirit as I need in my life because I struggle with these same things. I'm not preaching at you today. I'm preaching at myself. We are on a roller coaster ride up and down and up and down. We make decisions sometimes. We do a great job other days. We're just really crummy. Just like the disciples, right? Be it look at amazing things that they did. And I believe that you can too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray for our service of you. and We are up and down and up and down. Sometimes, God, we make great decisions and we are great servants. In other days, we just want to pound our chest and fight for our rights at the expense of others. So I just pray that you'd help us every single day to take stock and stop. And when we do make that mistake of trying to defend our rights at the expense of others, just let the Holy Spirit stop us and help us to reconcile those broken relationships that we've created. Because we can always go back and again correct those mistakes. You give us many opportunities in life to be able to do that and reconcile those relationships. That's what Jesus is all about. So God, as we face these decisions every day, we pray for your spirit to guide us and direct us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's blessing be with you. And uh, God's blessing be with you as you prepare for Holy Communion today.